All right. Y'all ready to get into the Word? Before we get into the, the message tonight, though, I have a handout. If I could get a couple of ushers, please, to help me real quickly, uh, just to pass these out. Somebody, if you would, pass these out. Make sure everybody gets one. And uh, hallelujah. Oh, I thought you was coming. There you go. Jeff's coming. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. When you get that handout, if you want to, just write up there someone on the top, part one. I forgot to put part one because there's going to be a, a lot of parts to this. All right? I want to make sure everybody gets one, and we're going to get started, okay? In the back, there you go. All right. Let's get started. Um, for those of you that were here, and a lot of you were not here, back in 2007, I did a series that I entitled, How to Create a Better Life. And so I can't think of a better title, so I'm going to stick with that, How to Create a Better Life. Uh, there was a lot, a lot of people that are here now that was not here back then, 16 years ago, and uh, recently someone called me and was asking me questions about certain things that I said. Well, then when Brother Dennis Sunday morning started talking about certain things about the brain and that reticular, you know, activating system in your, in your brain, uh, which I talked about that back in this series, it really just stirred my heart to go back and do this again. Now, I've Cannot say it the same way, cannot do it exactly the same way, but I am going to touch on most of the main principles that I taught on back then. Now, this is going to take us a long time. This is going to probably take us, because I realize looking back, uh, I would go for an hour and a half, sometimes more, and we cannot do that on Wednesday night because of school and work and so on and so forth, but I'm telling you, this is life-changing. As a matter of fact, those that are listening uh, online, if you can, be here because this series will literally change a person's life. Amen. It is one of the best series, I believe, that I have ever done, that the Lord has ever given me. And so for anybody who wants to have a better life, a better uh, marriage, wants to have better health, wants to have a better state of mind, wants to be better off financially in any way, I encourage you to take notes and study. There's going to be a lot of things that I say. If all you do is hear me say it in here and forget about it, it's not going to profit you. You're going to have to mix your faith with it. You're going to have to study on it. You're going to have to meditate on it. You're going to have to get it down in your heart, okay? So I'm going to be giving you handouts to help, but I'll be saying a lot of things that's not on the handout, but... Uh, the major points, especially if it's not on there, just jot it down so you can go back and look at it and study it and run scripture references for it because I want you to get it on the inside of you, all right? Now, back in uh, 07, the way this came about when it first started, uh, one day I came home, my wife had recorded uh, a program of Oprah's. Now, she wasn't in the habit of watching Oprah. She had just come across it accidentally something that was said caught her attention because of some things that I had been talking about where uh, faith and quantum physics were connected. It caught her attention, so she stopped and recorded it for me. And so when I came in and sat down and listened to it, I was very fascinated by it. It was a panel of people that were talking about a book that had been written called The Secret. And this sold millions of copies of the book, of the DVDs. And the main topic of the book was the law of attraction. Some of you may remember, you know. And, uh, and of course, they talked about how like attracts like. If you see it in your mind, you can see it in your hand. All that's true, okay. And uh, the things that are coming into your life are attracted by your 
most dominant thoughts, again, that is true. However, I discovered, after doing some research, that the author of the book called The Secret was promoting New Age teachings. Um, they completely, he completely left God out of the, of the subject. Left God completely out of anything to do with what's happening in our lives. And they basically said this, the universe responds to your thoughts and brings all of your desire, desires to pass. Well, this led me to this study. That led me to a, uh, I think back then was a 13 part, 12 or 13 part series that I did about how to create a better life. And I began to study the real secret I found in the Word of God to God's abundance. Now, let me stop right there, okay? Because when I say God's abundance, most people's mind immediately go to finances. As I was thinking about this and meditating on it, I began to see a lot of things in the Word of God where Paul prayed that we would abound more and more in the love of God. Isn't that love in abundance? How many of you want to have abundant love? Huh? Abundant love. If you want to have abundant love, uh, then you will practice, you will be living 1 Corinthians 13. And that's something that everybody needs to read constantly. You can never read it too much. You can never meditate in it too much. Because when you have love in abundance in your heart, then you're operating like God. For God is love. Amen? Amen. He is love. The very essence of God is love. Okay? And so what about peace? The Bible talks about peace that passes understanding. That's, that's peace abundantly. So don't think that when I say God's abundance, I'm talking about only finances. Does it include that? Yes, it does. Because God wants to meet every need of man, spirit, soul, body, financially, in every single way. All right? And what we're going to be looking at in this series is how to attract the provision of the kingdom of heaven into our lives. How am I going to attract what God has of his resources, the provisions of heaven into my life. Is it possible for a man or woman to live in such a way and to do certain things that is going to attract supernatural abundance into their lives? The answer is yes. Amen. And of course, the greatest secret of all is knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen? And knowing that his word is, connects us to the laws that govern his kingdom. I want you to let that settle in right now. The laws that govern God's kingdom. That is what the Word of God teaches us. It teaches us what those laws are. It teaches us how to activate those laws. And when you do, you literally are connecting to everything that God has. Now, having said that, let's look at John chapter 10 Verse 10. Now you have a handout, and at the top it says, Jesus came to give us what? Abundant, Abundant life. He said, The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, to destroy. I have come that you might have life. That's the Greek word zoe, zoe life. It's the very life of God, and that you might have it more abundantly. See, the Lord wants each and every one of us to understand what this life is all about. On your handout, abundant, super abundant in quality. This is what it means. It means, if you look it up and study it, to have abundant life, abundant means super abundant in quantity, superior in quality. I said that wrong to start with. Super abundant in quantity, in other words, more that you can have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. Super abundant in quantity, superior in quality. And it seems that there's a gap in what we say we believe and what we actually experience. If you talk to the average person who attends a Word of Faith church just like this, and I'm not talking about just talk to them one time, but I'm talking about if you get to know them, if you hang around them and fellowship with them, you will discover that there's a gap between what they say they believe 
and what they are literally experiencing in their everyday life. Because if you ask that person who attends a Word of Faith church, they will tell you we believe in divine healing, we believe in divine provision, we believe in supernatural peace, and on and on and on. But if you were to get to know them a little better, you would find out that many of them are constantly sick, they are always broke, are always lacking, they worry, they have fears in their life, and that is not what the life of God is all about. Amen? And so, there is a, you know, I don't know any way to say it, but it seems to a lot of people that true success has become elusive in their lives. And it's something that a lot of people have never experienced, but God wants you to, okay? God wants you to. Now, notice it says on your handout, the secret of success is the revelation, and you can put keys slash laws. Sometimes I may say keys, sometimes I say laws. It's the same thing. The secret of success is the revelation of keys or laws in God's Word that attract the blessings of the Lord. Okay? And I'm just telling you right now, when you understand these laws, when you understand these secrets that I'm talking to you about, the revelation of these laws, it's going to take you from where you are right now. Now, for those of you that say, I want to change something in my life, I encourage you to write it down somewhere on that piece of paper you have. What is it that you want to change? What is it that you want to get better? You may have one thing. You may have two things, okay? You may have three or four or ten. How many of you know that God can work on all of them at the same time as you're working on it? Amen. Right? It's like the minister Sunday morning was talking about the anointing. He said, you know, it's kind of like electricity. Electricity, it may heat cause one thing to get hotter while causing something else to get cooler. And it can work everywhere at the same time. Amen? Amen? And so I just want you to understand that you don't have to stay where you are physically, spiritually, mentally, financially, in your relationship or anything else. But faith in God, faith in his laws, activating the laws of God is going to take you to where you want to be. It's going to take you where you want to get to. You may, how many of you have ever uh, been riding around and you see somebody driving a, a, a better car or somebody living in a better house? Somebody seems to be a lot happier than you are. Some, someone who seems to have a better marriage. Someone who seems that their children are living a, a, a much better life than your kids. And you've thought, I, I wish I was that way. I wish we were that way. I wish I had that. I wish we could. you could have all of that. You can have all of that. But here's what most people do. They get in the flesh and they start comparing. They get jealous. They get angry. They blame God. They blame others. Instead of looking at the situation as it really is and say, you know what, I got to where I'm at because of a certain way of thinking, believing, things that I've done, why should I blame anyone else? Because it's like I, I, I said one time here not long ago, you know, the way that I grew up, the things that we went through, was not my fault because I was a child. But once I grew up and I left home, it became my responsibility what happened to me, the life that I was going to live from there moving forward up until this day, my responsibility. Now, you can continue to blame it on your parents and grandparents and society or the church that you came from or everything else. But the truth is, you can have the life that you want because God's on your side. God is for you. God will help you. God watches over his word to perform it. I'm telling you right now, if you take any of the laws that I'm going to be talking to you about and say, I'm going to study and meditate and pray until I understand this law, and then I am going to activate this law, I guarantee you, you are going to attract things from heaven. God's world will come into your world. 
okay? But it doesn't happen automatically, as you're going to see, okay? Look with me real quick in the Psalm 78, 41. Now, this, this is not, uh, I don't think this is on you. It may be there, but let's see. Yeah, you must be willing to face your present limitations. This is on your handout. If you want to just jot Psalm 78, 41 beside it. You must be willing to face your present limitations in order to break down barriers. Now, I like to point this out because a lot of people think, well, if God wanted me to have that, do that, go there, become that, then he would have already done it. No, that's not true. Even Israel was told that they limited, they turned back. What did they turn back from? They turned back from what God was offering them. Why? Because they were tested. They were trials. They were giants. There were things that looked like would be limitations and became limitations simply because they turned back. If they would have done what Joshua and Caleb did and pressed forward in the face of the giants, in the face of the tribulation and the trouble, I'm telling you right now, the day will come in America where men will cry in the streets begging God for mercy because they turned their back on him. It is coming. Mark my words, it is coming. God's people are going to have to know how to believe him for supernatural provision, for supernatural help. Now, I didn't intend to say that, and it wasn't in my notes. But I'm just telling you right now, we are in those times that the Spirit of God warned us of the perilous times. We're living in them right now. Jesus is coming back. The tribulation is coming upon the face of this world. I am not worried about it. I am not afraid of it. You know why? Because God has been preparing us. And in the face of all of that, God will make a difference in the lives of his people who chose to serve him, to worship him, to know him, and to know his ways. Okay? So he says, and limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited God. God didn't put the limits on them. They limited God. They put the limits on what God was able to do in their life. Now, Joshua and Caleb didn't put no limits. Joshua and Caleb said, we are well able. Why? Because God's with us. We are well able. Amen. Amen? The things you have in your heart to do, you need to say, look at it and say, we're well able. Why? Because if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? Amen? Our God is able. God can make supernatural things happen. Do y'all remember here, um, just uh, not this last Sunday, the Sunday before, that I put that picture of that check up on the, on the screen. Y'all remember that? When I preached out in uh, Moulton, Alabama, January the 4th, Five, six, seven. Three days later, a man who gave a significant seed in the offering got that check for 52000 something from the IRS. Out of the blue, totally unexpected, he said. He said, I've never got anything from the IRS. I've never done nothing but paid it in. But he said, when I, he went up to, came up to me after I preached that night. He said, from now on, I will be handling my business differently. I will be doing business business differently when it comes to the kingdom of God because of some things that I said about business. Now, that same pastor sent me a message um, Sunday. Same pastor. He said, I'll call you tomorrow. I got another testimony I want to tell you. So I talked to him Monday, and he said, a woman who her and her husband owned ch uh, chicken houses they sowed a seed, and she said, last week, they sold a load of chickens, one load of chickens, and they profited 20,000 more than they ever have before. Now, you can say, well, that's just coincidence all you want to. I believe in the supernatural. I believe in multiplication. 
I believe these people heard some things of some laws, and they activated the laws. They put them in motion, and because of that, God obligated himself. Um, I believe it was Holly who gave me a book on the Hosea, was that you gave me the book at Christmas, a very, very old book. Now, I had been very interested in this because of the word H-E-S-E-D in the Hebrew, Hesed, and a lot of times it's translated favor or grace or mercy, and Billy Brim had been talking about this some in the last year or so, and so as I was studying this, something jumped out at me that I knew there was something there I had never seen before. Are y'all ready for this? It literally means, and I'm talking about it is over and over and over, over and over in the Bible. It literally means that when you do what God says for you to do, he obligates himself to do what he said to do, but that he would do. He is literally obligated. When you tithe, God is obligated to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you. When you give, God is obligated to move on people to give to you. Press down, shaking together, and running over. That's multiplied. Amen? Now I got to move. Y'all done slowed me down on my, on, on my notes here. Okay? Philemon, verse 6. There's only one chapter in Philemon. And if you would, just put it in the King James. Uh, I'll probably read it also from the Amplified Classic, but in the King James for right now. Now, Paul says that the communication of your faith may become effectual, how? By the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. If you ask the average Christian, what good thing is in you in Christ Jesus, they probably can't even tell you. They say, well, I'm a sinner. No, that's not, Jesus is not a sinner, right? So if there's a good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus, it has nothing to do with sin, has nothing to do with sickness, and disease, and defeat, and depression, and all that, right? As a matter of fact, the, the Epiphany Classic says that it's ours in our identification with Christ Jesus unto his glory. In other words, because I'm identified with him as he is, so am I in this world. He is righteous, and John says we are righteous even as he is righteous. Not based on our works, not based on what we've done or haven't done, but based on who Jesus is, the righteous one who lives in us and imparted to us the righteousness of God. I am. We are the righteousness of God in him, Paul said. Right? So he says that the communication, now the word communication. Let's see. Uh, notice what it says. We discovered that the release of our faith is to produce a desired effect. Now, that word communication means to release or to transfer. Effectual means to be productive or producing the desired effect. Let me say it again. Communication means to release or to transfer your faith. Effectual means productive or producing the desired effect. Let me tell you what the very essence of faith is all about. The very essence of faith is is about taking you from the things that you desire to possessing those things. From things desired to things possessed. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe, you receive, you shall have. Right? You see, God wants you to understand that if you really understand the law of faith and how it works. Now, Paul calls it, in Romans chapter 3, he calls it the law of faith. Now, if you know anything about laws, you know laws are no respect to persons. Just like God, no respect to person. Gravity is no respect to person. If I trip, I fall just like you trip and you fall. Right? right. A law works the same way, the same time. Uh, the same, listen, it works the same way every time, every place, for every person. I've said it before. If it's, for example, if everybody started floating, that would be a phenomenon. That would not be a law. If everybody in this place all of a sudden just started floating in midair, that would not be a law. Because the law says that if you're up here, you're going to hit here. Yeah. Right? right? That's a law. A law means that you know the outcome 
before you ever put it into effect. I know right now, standing right here, that if I go outside, get on a ladder, get on top of that building, and I step off, I'm going downward. I know the result before I ever step off, right? I know the result of tithing before I tithe. I know the result of forgiving before I forgive. I know, listen to me, the result of the law of confession. Before I ever say anything, I know the result because I understand that God has called us to inherit a blessing. He said, therefore, do not curse, but bless. Don't curse people. Bless them. Don't belittle them. Don't degrade them. Don't downgrade them. Speak highly of them. Bless them. And when you do, blessings come back to you. We're talking about laws, right? Amen. So I can put it like this. Faith is a productive force that produces a desired effect. Faith is a productive force that produces a desired effect. Now, I don't know about you, but I just want to see the stagnation bro broken off of people's lives. Amen. Amen? I hate to see people that are stuck in a bad place. Hallelujah. There's a lot of people that are not experiencing the abundant life that Jesus came to give. Now, I did not say, now listen, if you're born again, you have received the life of God. But he said, I've come that you might have life, but that you might also have it more abundantly. Amen. There's a lot of people who have life, but they don't have abundant life. They're not experiencing the abundant life. It's not superior in quantity, okay, or in quality. Things can get better. How many believe in everything can get better? Yeah, amen. amen? So, what I'm going to be doing, and we're going to be sharing with you a lot about the keys or the laws to just help anybody who wants to break out of mediocrity. Honey, do you remember when we was in Bible school and Tony Cook told us the definition of mediocre? What was it? Halfway up the mountain. Yeah, thank you. Halfway up the mountain. That's the meaning of mediocre. How many of you want to be halfway up the mountain? Huh? <laughs> Or you want to go to the top of the mountain. That's what I'm talking about, your life getting better. All right? Breaking out of mediocrity. Okay? Stepping into new, new levels of abundance. Regardless of what it is, abundant joy, peace, love, finances, or whatever it might be. Look with me in Matthew 16 and verse 19. And so, according on your handout, according to Matthew 16, verse 19, Jesus gave us keys or laws that govern access to and attract manifestation of the kingdom of God. If you would put that up in the Amplified for me, uh, Matthew 16, verse 19, the Amplified version. Because this verse is talking about the laws that govern access or, or attract uh, the, the manifestation of the kingdom of God into our life. Amen. Jesus said, I will give you the keys, authority of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind, forbid, declare to be improper and lawful on earth, will have already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose, permit, declare lawful on earth, will already been loosed in heaven. So, what is the kingdom of God? If you're taking notes, just jot it down. One thing, the kingdom of God is God's rule. R-U-L-E. It's God's rule. The kingdom of God is a combination of the the location and the resources of God it's a combination of the location and the resources of God and the system by which you access them into your life get this now the kingdom of God is the system by which you access all of heaven's provision all of heaven's resources if you could take a trip to heaven tonight and look around. Do you think that you might find whatever it is you're looking for on, and need on this earth? Think about this for a moment. There's no lack in heaven. No sickness, no disease, no, no tears, no defeat. Everything you need. Everything we need, God has. 
That's the reason Paul said, but my God shall supply. Now, Paul's speaking in the office of the apostle to a people who have partnered with him. Do you all understand? It would be no different if I, as your pastor, you have been tithing, you have been sowing your seed into the mission, into the building fund, you've been giving to the guest ministers, you are a faithful tither and giver. It would be no different for me to say to you right now, my God, because of the place that I stand in and the relationship that I have with him and the relationship that I have with you as your pastor, as your shepherd, I can say to you, but my God will supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen? Everything that we need, God's got it. Amen? And he wants us to have it. Hallelujah. Now, God's kingdom is one of order and operates by divinely appointed laws. I think on here we say the kingdom of God is God's rule by which we access his provision or resources. God's kingdom is one of order and operates by divinely appointed laws. God appointed these laws. God's the one who gave us these laws. We are the ones who set the laws in motion. Okay? It's very important that you understand that. Understanding and operating in these laws will bring heaven's provision into your life. Now, write this down because it's not on your, on your paper, okay? You attract, let's put it like this, we attract everything into our life by thoughts we hold in our mind. We attract everything into our life by thoughts we hold in our mind. That's the reason I call it God's law of attraction. God's law of attraction. Give, it will be given to you, right? And if you stand praying, forgive. Why? Because if you don't forgive, neither will your sins be forgiven you. It's God's law of attraction. Like attracts like. But here's the thing. Most people's daily thoughts, I'm talking about the thoughts that you think from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to sleep at night. If you could trace those thoughts, most people's thoughts are not constantly in agreement with God's thoughts. Thoughts are very fleeting, as you know. I mean, you can just be going on long minding your own business and be just thinking about one thing, and all of a sudden, bam, upside the head, here comes a thought. And you wonder, where did that come from? Thoughts come from the enemy. Thoughts come from God. Thoughts come from your own, uh, within your own self. And you've got to make sure... You know what? I'm going to begin to make some changes about my thought life, the way I'm thinking. If you read that post that I put on Facebook, the private page yesterday, you will remember that I was talking about how that I've read that doctors say that a certain percentage of people that come to them are psychosomatic. Now, you cannot convince them. Psycho dealing with the mind, psych, mind, soma, the body. Psychosomatic is a connection between the mind and the body. They run tests. They cannot find anything wrong with them, but yet they have the symptoms. Why? Because they believe it. One woman, her, I am not kidding you, she went through everything that a woman who is pregnant goes through, without me going into the gory details of it. Her belly swelled everything stopped that was supposed to be flowing and working and after nine months I think she was pregnant goes to the hospital and the doctors they take her in she's not pregnant but she was convinced she was pregnant and her body agreed with it doctors will give people a placebo which is nothing but a water pill and one man listen to me 
one man, the doctor treated him with placebo pills, told him it was a miracle drug. The man had cancer. He said, this is a miracle drug. Because the man, there was no cure. He was already that far gone. There was no cure. He said, this is a miracle drug that will cure your cancer. And the man started taking them and believed him, and the cancer went away. I could tell you all kind of A man got locked in a, a storage, one of those cold storage freezers. And when they found him, he froze to death. The problem was the freezer was not even turned on. This is true. I'm not making this up. So if your body will respond to your thoughts, what about the rest of your life? Everything responds to your thoughts. That's the reason the Bible says as a man thinks, so is he. All right? Okay, i got to hurry. I really want to get through this page right here, okay? Now, God's law of attraction is about, look right in the middle of the page, God's law of attraction is about, number one, renewing the mind and establishing the heart and transforming your personal belief system. Let me say it again. God's law of attraction is about renewing the mind, establishing the heart, and transforming your personal belief system. And just jot down Proverbs 23, 7. I already quoted it. You know what it says. you got to really watch your thoughts. I challenge you to keep a record of your thoughts for one week. As much as possible. Now, I know they come so fast you cannot stop and take the time. But as much as possible, keep track of your thoughts about God, about life, about your health, about your money, about your relationship, about everything. Keep track. And then at one, at the one week, go back and look at them. And check everyone that's positive and agrees with what God says. And put an X on every one. That does not, it's negative and it does not agree with what God says about you or about anything else that you were thinking about. Blessed is the man whose mind is stayed on thee, thou will keep him, y'all ready for this? In the Hebrew, peace, peace, double peace. That's what the Hebrew says. You will keep him in peace, peace, double peace. That's abundance, folks. In spite of everything that's going on, you still have peace. Okay? What you focus on, listen to me, it's on your paper right there. What you focus on the longest becomes the strongest. What are you focusing on? John Maxwell, who is an excellent minister on leadership, he's called it the law of magnetism. The law of magnetism. What you focus on the longest becomes the strongest. So what are you focusing on? Are you focusing on the problem? Are you focusing on what God says, the answer? God's report, the doctor's report, or the bank's report. Say it out loud. I am a human magnet. Let that sink in. I am a human magnet. And I am attracting to me certain things. Now, what do you want to attract to you? Now, what if you like a real magnet? It, you know, if you had a magnet big, big enough... And you walk through here, it just starts snatching stuff. Like that necklace, it just starts pulling it. it did anything metal, it just starts snatching it, right? Well, what are you pulling to you when you walk around in this world, in this life? What are you attracting to you? What's headed your way? Is blessings headed your way or the curse? Because they're both alive and active in this world. All right? Now, let me tell you something. Once your mind is renewed and your heart's established... And your life is in agreement. I'm talking about in agreement, aligned with the kingdom principles. You're living every day. I'm so thankful. I know Allie talked about it in here the other night. I talked about it back there. Dennis touched on it in here. I think Josh talked about it. I think Milton talked about it. In the last six, seven services, it's like everybody's just been bam, 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 bam. You cannot just think, I can say, well, I'm blessed and I'm a millionaire. Once a week, and it's going to happen. No, it's not going to work that way. Your, your confession should be a 24-7 type of confession. 
In other words, that's all you ever say. You're always talking about you're healed. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. You're never talking about you're sick. You're never talking about how bad, how bad your head hurts or your back hurts. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? People around you, even your closest family members, they don't even know that your head hurts. You know why? Because you refuse to get in agreement with it. People don't know that if you're behind on a bill. You know why? Because you won't get in agreement with that. All you're doing is, by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. I rebuke pain. I resist debt. Debt's under my feet. Take it. Dance all over it. Amen. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. Hey, not only that, my God supplies all my needs. I call that bill paid in Jesus' name. I've sowed my seed. I'm a tither. The money's on the way. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, just jot this down. Proverbs 4.23. The Bible tells us, above everything else, to guard your heart. Guard your heart. Amen. And we know, according to Proverbs 23.7, we got to be thinking the right way. You've got to guard your thinking. You've got to guard your heart. If you go back and look at Genesis 12, 2, you'll find that God had to change Abram, Abram's view of his own self. Put that up for us to see in Genesis 12, verse 2. Let me say that again. God had to change Abram's view of himself. Now, we'll get deeper in that in this series about your self-image. All right? God said to him, did y'all know that Abram came from a people who worship a moon god. And God said, listen, you, you come out from among them and you do what I'm telling you to do and go where I tell you to go. I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great and you'll be a blessing. What's he doing, folks? All of a sudden, he's trying to get Abram to have a different view of himself. That I'm a worshiper of the real true God who loves me and I have his favor, I have his mercy, I have his blessing. He can make my name great. I am somebody to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I'm going to be a blessing to other people. Yes. Let me tell you what you're going to be doing over the next two or three months. If you're really listening and paying attention, you're going to go through what I call God's extreme makeover. How many of you remember a TV show way, way back in there, 15, 20 years ago, called Extreme Makeover? They focused on the outside. Everything that went on in that program, on that show, it was all about the extreme makeover, the makeup they wore, the clothes they wore. They changed their hair. They, I mean, they went through surgery. and I mean, uh, it's plastic surgery and on and on. But when God does an extreme makeover, he focuses on the inside. He doesn't focus on the outside. Now, I didn't say that a while ago to put condemnation. It just came up in my spirit. Some people took that the wrong way. I didn't say that to put condemnation on anybody, okay? If you want to have cosmetic surgery, which I know a lot of people have it, that's fine. That's, that's nothing to do with me whatsoever. I could care less one way or the other. It's like makeup. If you want to wear makeup, well, I take that back. Please wear makeup. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. I don't care about that. So don't ever take something, you know, the wrong way. Brother Dennis told me something while we was eating lunch. He was talking about how people hear things. He said, he said, I was having lunch with a really good friend of mine. A black minister, and I'm saying black for a purpose so you'll understand where I'm coming from. He said, I was eating lunch with him many, many years ago. Oral Roberts was still alive. And he said, Oral Roberts, on, while he was preaching one day, had said that God is doing great and wonderful things in the world today. And he's raising up wonderful, large black ministries. And so Brother Dennis said, I was having lunch with this black pastor. And while we was eating lunch, he said, did you hear about what Orr, what Orr said? He said, yeah. He said, I thought it was great. And the pastor said, I did too. He said, but most black people didn't hear what you heard and what I hear. He said, what do you mean? 
He said, black people don't hear the same way that white people hear. They heard him say that God can even use black people as if that was the last thing he was going to do. And he said, I was just blown away by that. And when he said that, Milton, I said, you know, no wonder. For years I've wondered about this. Jesus not only said, be careful what you hear. In one place he said, be careful how you hear. See, a lot of people, they can hear us say something and get offended by it. And we didn't mean for it to be taken, you know, by an offense. We, we said it in a good way to lift up. To bring correction and perfection and to help people. But a lot of times, people take it the wrong way. All right? So hear me when I'm telling you, when God begins to do an extreme makeover on you, listen to me. If you want to keep working on the outside, that's fine. Just let him work on the inside. And participate with him. Cooperate with him. Let him have his way. Let the grace of God do what it's intended to do in your life. Don't push it down. Don't ignore it when he's trying to talk to you about an attitude, a certain pattern of thinking, a certain pattern of the way you've been speaking. Listen to him. Pay attention to him. Make your decision. I'm going to correct this. Why? Because this is a year of correction and perfection. Amen? Look, we've been Matthew 6, verse 10. Hallelujah. I'm just telling you right now, as you conform your thinking to kingdom laws, you're going you're gonna to go through that radical transformation that the Apostle Paul talked about that he wants to, God wants you to go through, okay? And it's going to come from the inside out. Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, <clears throat> listen carefully what I'm going to say to you. God's intent is to bring heaven to earth, but it is not automatic. God's intent is to bring heaven to earth, but it's not automatic. I'm going to, let me give you two things. Number one, thinking patterns have to change. Thinking patterns must change. That's the reason Jesus in Mark 1, 14 and 15, he came and he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Change the way that you're thinking. You can't access heaven the way that you're thinking. So that's the reason he spent all that time with those disciples. Like when he was preaching that day using Peter's boat, they fished all night long. They were operating in the natural. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? They were operating in the natural the way they had been taught all of their life, just like all of us. I don't know what you grew up doing. I don't know what your parents did for a living. But listen, to every one of us were taught in the natural realm of certain ways to do things. Peter had learned. He was a professional fisherman. He had been out there all night long, and the Bible says, he said, we have told and have not caught anything. But he had just let Jesus use his boat. That is a fishing business. And now, you know what he's done? When you take anything that you have out of your hand and put it into God's hand, it is no longer under the jurisdiction of earth, but under the jurisdiction of a new government, the kingdom of heaven. All right? When it comes under that jurisdiction, earth cannot cause, listen to me, nothing supernatural to happen like it does when it comes in the jurisdiction of heaven. So then Jesus said, we'll throw your net over there. They threw it out. They started breaking. Pull them in. Fill the ship up. Call the partners. Fill their ship up. I'm telling you, God wants to fill my ship up. And all of you partners, he wants to fill your ship up too. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So number one, thinking patterns have to change. Number two, laws have to be learned and operated. Laws have to be learned and operated. Look at Psalm 115. Verse 16. Y'all give me 10 minutes. They usually go to 815 down at the youth group. Now listen. In Psalm 115, verse 16, I want you to notice something here, okay? God said the heaven, even the heavens. See, there's three heavens. Paul said a new man called it to the third heaven. There's three heavens. There's the heaven above our head. There's the stellar heavens, you know, above that. The planet and the you know, systems and all that. 
But then there's the heaven where God dwells. He said the heaven, even heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. One translation says he put men in charge of the earth. Well, go back and read it for yourself. Did he not put Adam and Eve in charge of the earth? Did he not give them dominion over everything that he created? Read Psalms 8. Read Hebrews 2. He quotes, the, the, the writer of Hebrews, he quotes the psalmist out of Psalms 8. And he said he put everything under our feet. He crowned man with honor and glory. He gave us total dominion over the earth. And so we get heaven to earth by operating in the laws of the kingdom. Now, let me just throw something at you real quickly. In Genesis 1.26, I know that you know this, but I'm going to share something with you you might not know. God said, let us create man in our image, in our likeness, right? The word image refers to inherent tendencies or instincts. Inherent tendencies or instincts. In other words, he said, let's create man with our own inherent tendencies and instincts. After our likeness, and that word likeness refers to function or characteristic action. In other words, he created man with the same tendencies and instincts that God himself had to function just like he functioned. How did God function? By faith. We understand the world for framed by the word of God. We understand we frame our world by our words. God framed the world he created with his words. You are Actually creating your world with your words. I know that people don't believe me a lot of times. When I go to other churches, I know y'all believe me. I I go to a lot of churches and I tell them, my wife and children and my grandchildren have never heard me say I'm sick. And I don't think they believe me. (laughs) We don't say we can't afford We don't say we can't afford. Never tell your children we can't afford that. If you don't want them to have it, just say no. If you want them to have it and don't have the money, say we will believe for it. Our God is able. Go sow a seed. Your children have money to sow. Amen? Teach them biblical principles. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, real quickly, before we go, I want to give you the four laws of Genesis that's on your paper. Y'all ready? And maybe we'll go into it. Okay, which one did I skip? Law of magnetism. What you focus on, what you give attention to, or renew your mind with, you attract to yourself. You got that? It's the law of magnetism. Everybody say, I'm a magnet. So what you focus on, what you give your attention to, what you renew your mind with, you attract to yourself. Have you ever heard the term, well, they must have a target on their back? What does that mean? They're always attracting something bad to them. Huh? It's like that old, uh, uh, that old song used to come on, hee-haw, you know? I mean, folks, <laughs> if, it can ha- if it's bad, if it can happen, it'll happen to me, he'd say. And stuff like that, you know? I wish I could remember the words. That song of Vernon was here. He'd sing it for us. <laughs> you know? Yeah, rude, despair, agony on me. And man, he's talking about a terrible song. You, if you're going to have a target on your back, it ought to be a target for the blessings of God, Amen. for victory, for good things always happening because your trust is in the Lord. Amen? Four laws of Genesis. Y'all ready? Number one. Now, I want y'all to get this, okay? Number one, legal authority to rule was given to man. This is the four laws of Genesis. Legal authority. You have legal authority to rule in this earth. If I had the time, I'd take you and show you where Jesus, the man, commanded the wind to stop, the sea to be calm, demons to leave, sickness to depart from bodies, the dead to be raised. Why? Because he was a man. He was a God-man, a man with the life of God, a man who knew that legal authority was given to man. He came as a man to be an example. Let me put it to you like this. 
the Son of God came to the sons of men so the sons of men could become sons of God. And that's exactly the way you ought to be operating this earth as a son of God. Man, but a son of God. Okay? So, number two. God didn't include himself in the legal authority structure over earth. God did not include himself in the legal authority structure over earth. Number three, any influence from the supernatural realm, I'm going to read it to you like this and we'll make sure we fill it, make you get it filled in. Any influence from the supernatural realm on earth is only legal through man. I'm talking about heavenly or demonic. Any influence from the supernatural realm on earth, whether heavenly or demonic, whether angels or demons, is only legal through man. God gave angels to help us. Okay? Satan has demons that are out to hurt, to harm. But I'm telling you right now, you need to understand this, that any influence from the supernatural realm on earth, whether heavenly or demonic, is only legal through man. That's why you've got to resist the devil. And you've got to resist demons. And you've got to be willing to, to listen if God sends angels to you. And to acknowledge that angels are with you at all the time. And surround you and your children. Amen. Number four, God has made himself subject to his own law and will not violate it. God has made himself subject to his own law. That's, that's amazing. And he will not violate. He will not break his own word. That's the reason you have to know what it means that when you live by faith and God says, he makes a promise and he says, if you do this, then I'll do this. There is no room for doubt whatsoever to the person who lives by faith. Because you know that God is not a man. He should lie. If he said it, he will do it. He's obligated himself to do it. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. He's, he's made him subject to his own law. He can't violate it. That last one, we're going to get on next week. If you want to go ahead and fill it in, that'd be fine. Law of motion, anything in motion stays in motion. And it's acted upon by an opposite and equal force. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you right now, there are things that each one of us have set in motion in our lives. At some time or another in our lives, we set certain things in motion that we never intended to happen. We set things in motion that we did not want, but yet we set them in motion by our thoughts, by our beliefs, by our words, by our actions. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's good. Think about that for a moment. Practice tomorrow smiling at people. And see what they do. Just walk around tomorrow. Make yourself a note. I'm going to smile at everybody I see. I'm going to smile at people I like. I'm going to smile at people I don't like. <laughs> I'm going to smile at people that don't like me. I'm going to smile at people that are grumpy and mean looking. Just smile at them real big. No matter where you are, just walk by and go, <laughs> and see what they do. I can almost guarantee you that 999 out of 1,000 will smile back. Now, they may be wondering, why are they smiling at me? I don't like them. <laughs> Wonder why you smiling at me. <laughs> it's just a law. Okay? Hallelujah. I hope this helped you tonight. Amen. I'm excited about it. We're going to get into some really, really good stuff. Let's pray. Father, we humble ourselves before you once again, and we acknowledge that you are good. Your mercy endures forever. Your way is perfect. We thank you, Lord, that you sent Jesus into this earth to be an example for all of us that would believe in him as our Lord and Savior. He walked in total victory. He walked by faith. He operated in the laws of your kingdom. And by doing so, he showed us how that we could also live in victory. I thank you, Father God, for just putting in every person's heart and mind 
the diligence that it takes to press through the resistance, to press through the distractions, to press through the tribulations, and know that if we do what you tell us to do, we are going to come out on the other side shining, hallelujah, with the glory of God walking in total victory in our lives. I thank you, Lord, because there's nothing too hard, nothing impossible. We praise you, Father God, right now. The Faith Family Church is reaching the world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you, Father God. We are moving forward, and we will build. We thank you, Father God, that we have everything that we need. We may not see it with our natural eye, but with the eye of faith, we see it. We believe we have it, and we praise you for it. We thank you we have favor with you and with man. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your blessings. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right.